Good afternoon, everyone. This is Gwen Costin from GSA, and I'm here to welcome you to today's Digital Gov University webinar, Machine Learning, How the Bureau of Labor Statistics Did It. We're all very lucky today to hear from Alex Measure, who's an economist turned machine learning and natural language processing practitioner at BLS. He designs, builds, and maintains machine learning systems that automate difficult text classification, information extraction, and record matching problems in production systems. We're very, very excited to have him here with us today. And just to let you know, um, if you have any questions, just put them in the chat box and we'll be peppering them through Alex's presentation today. And without any further ado, Alex. Uh, thank you very much, Gwen. Um, I'm very excited to be here today. Um, so as the title of this presentation suggests, uh, machine learning is not something new at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, in fact, it's something that we're using uh, very extensively now uh, and have been for several years. Uh, and so what I'd like to do is talk about the, uh, the story uh, of how we got here, how we addressed the various issues that came up, uh, and how we implemented these systems uh, into existing production processes. Uh, so the story of machine learning at BLS uh, starts uh, with a survey that we call the Survey of Occupational Injuries and Illnesses. Uh, the purpose of this survey is to measure work-related injuries in the U.S. Uh, and one of the ways we do this is by each year collecting hundreds of thousands of written descriptions of work-related injury and illness like the example you see here. Uh, so as you can see, uh, these narratives include a variety of information. It includes a job title, uh, typically describing the occupation of the worker. And typically it also contains several sentences describing what the employee was doing, uh, what happened, what sort of, what part of body was affected, uh, and what object directly harmed the employee. Uh, this information is very useful for answering all sorts of questions like, uh, you know, which occupations are more dangerous than other occupations, what are the most common causes of injuries uh, in these various occupations. Uh, but before we can do that, uh, we have to do one more step. Uh, we have to go through this data uh, and assign codes uh, to indicate key characteristics, characteristics of interest. Uh, so this particular narrative here uh, would receive an occupation code of 372011, indicating that this is a janitor, uh, and it would re receive a variety of other codes uh, capturing different aspects of this incident. Uh, now, the way we've assigned these codes for most of our history um, is by hand. Uh, so we have people reading these narratives and assigning these codes. Uh, and as you can imagine, there are some difficulties with doing it this way. Uh, one difficulty, of course, is that this takes a lot of resources. Uh, in fact, uh, we estimate that if you were to sit down and try and code all the data that we collect in a single year, uh, it would take you about 12 years working full time uh, on nothing else. Uh, so obviously we uh, don't have just one person working on this. Uh, we have dozens of people across the country, um, but that introduces uh, additional challenges. Uh, for example, we found that this is a very difficult task to teach people. Um, there are hundreds of different occupation codes, for example, 840 different occupation codes, 1400 source codes, uh, there are complex rules for deci deciding when one of these codes takes precedence over the other. Uh, and the result of that uh, is that we find when we, uh, if we take two expert human coders and we have them code the exact same narratives, uh, we find they assign the same codes uh, only about 70% of the time. Uh, so obviously this is uh, not an uh, ideal sort of outcome for a process like this. Uh, and so these and other considerations uh, motivated us to look into ways to get computers uh, to perform this task. Uh, so how do you get a computer to do something like reading a narrative uh, and assigning a code? Uh, well, it turns out there's a few ways. Uh, one approach, which I'll call sort of the traditional, the rule-based knowledge engineering approach, uh, follows the, the following idea. Um, if you want the computer to do something, you, compl you tell the computer everything that it needs to know and do to perform that task. 
Uh, so for example, if we're building an occupation autocoder, uh, we might come up with a big list of all the job titles we expect to see and all the occupation codes that should be assigned uh, when those job titles occur. Uh, now this approach works well for relatively simple tasks. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, as soon as you start working with language, uh, language as humans use it, uh, even language as simplified and restricted as a job title, uh, we're no longer working with simple tasks. Uh, so for example, in a single year of data that we collect through this survey, uh, we typically get about 2,000 different job titles, all corresponding uh, to this single occupation code, uh, 372011, which means roughly a janitor. Uh, that's 2,000 different ways to call someone a janitor, uh, which means we need a lot of rules in our rule-based system. Uh, to make matters worse, uh, many of these job titles uh, have never occurred before, so it's kind of hard to add them to our rule-based system if we don't know uh, what's going to show up. Uh, and to make matters even uh, more complicated, uh, it turns out that many of these job titles map to many different codes uh, based on other information, uh, such as the job title practices of the specific companies uh, and industries. So the result when you're um, using a, a approach like this uh, is that it often takes a huge amount of time uh, people have spent decades building systems like this, uh, and even after all that work, uh, very often you will end up with a system that doesn't work very well. Uh, so fortunately, uh, there is an alternative, um, and that alternative is something uh, called machine learning, uh, specifically a, a type of machine learning called supervised machine learning. Uh, the idea in supervised machine learning is that instead of trying to hand program in all of the information to the computer system, uh, we will instead try to teach the computer how to learn from data. Uh, we will then gather up a bunch of previously coded data and see if we can get the computer to learn how to perform the task from this previously coded data. Uh, this is a very uh, relatively simple recipe, as you can see. Uh, it's also a very flexible recipe. You can apply this uh, to just about any task, and in fact, uh, this basic idea is used for everything from self-driving cars to um, smart home speakers that can understand what you say. Uh, supervised machine learning is the basis for most of what gets called artificial intelligence today, and it has a few things going for it. Uh, one thing uh, that we'll see in just a second is uh, that it tends to work very well if you have a lot of training data. Uh, another big advantage, uh, as we will also see, is that it's uh, much easier to implement uh, than these rule-based systems. Uh, in fact, it's easy enough to implement uh, that I can put all the code for a machine learning system uh, on a single slide. Uh, so on this slide, uh, we have some code using the Python programming language, which is a, a free open source programming language. We're using a library called Scikit-Learn, uh, and we're using this library to read in some data, uh, some injury narratives, uh, train a logistic regression model uh, to look at the words that occur in those narratives and figure out how they're associated uh, with the various codes that can be assigned. Uh, and then we're using that model uh, to assign codes to new narratives that have not yet been coded. Uh, so this is the basic process uh, we used to build our initial machine learning systems. Uh, now, once you build a machine learning system, the first question, uh, hopefully, is does it work? Um, <laughs> we decided to answer that in the standard uh, following standard practice among machine learning practitioners. Uh, and the way you do that is that you construct a test data set uh, and you evaluate performance on that data. Um, so in our case, our test data set is something we call our gold standard. It's a sample of a thousand cases uh, which we've collected through our survey. Uh, these are cases that have already gone through our normal coding process. And what we've done is we've had We've removed the codes that were assigned to these cases, and we have each one recoded from scratch by three separate experts, uh, with a fourth expert going through and resolving coding disagreements. We call the codes that come from that process our gold standard codes. Uh, they are our closest measure 
of what the true or correct codes should be. And um, by comparing the performance of other systems uh, to these gold standard codes, uh, we can measure how well those systems perform. Uh, so for example, to evaluate our machine learning system, uh, we simply train this machine learning system on a separate set of data. Uh, we then use that system to generate codes for the gold standard data. And we look at how often these codes line up with the codes assigned uh, by our expert coders. Uh, and if we do this, we can calculate a variety of metrics. Uh, one of the simplest metrics is something called accuracy. Uh, it's basically just the portion of codes uh, that match the gold standard code. And what you can see here is that uh, on occupation coding, for example, our machine learning system is assigning the same code uh, as our expert coders 74% of the time. Uh, it's doing a little higher accuracy on nature and part, and then a little lower on event and source. So uh, is this a good autocoder? Um, obviously that's an important question. Uh, it's also kind of a tricky question uh, because we don't have a baseline uh, to compare against. Uh, so fortunately, the way that we constructed our gold standard uh, allows us to also measure the accuracy of our existing manual process. Uh, and that manual process, as an aside, uh, is a little bit more complicated than just one person assigning the code. Uh, it starts off with one of our staff in one of our state offices reading the narrative and assigning codes. Uh, those codes then go through an elaborate rule-based system that automatically checks for coding inconsistencies. Those codes then get reviewed by staff in our regional offices, and then again, finally, in our national office. Um, so this is the human process uh, that we're evaluating here. Uh, and what we find when we compare these codes assigned by this process uh, to our gold standard uh, is that in fact, on each of these tasks, uh, our machine learning system uh, is more accurate than our existing process. Uh, so this is, uh, in fact, uh, at least a, a promising autocoder. Uh, and this is the power of machine learning. Uh, with relatively little work, you know, code that you can fit on a single slide, uh, but lots of training data, uh, we're able to build a system uh, that can perform a very complicated task uh, as accurately or more accurately uh, than trained human staff. Uh, so uh, this is, of course, not the end of, uh, of the project. We now have to figure out uh, what we're going to do with a system like this. Um, and if all you looked at is the accuracy metrics, you might be tempted to just transfer everything uh, to automated coding. Uh, if you think about it a little more, though, however, and if you know a little bit about how this coding actually works, uh, there's good reason to suspect that even if the computer is better on average uh, than our existing manual process, there will still be situations uh, where our manual process is going to be better. Uh, and one of the reasons we believe that's the case uh, is because we know there are situations where we collect narratives that contain insufficient information to uh, reliably assign a code. Uh, in those situations, the correct response is not to try and guess the code, but rather to go back and either collect additional information from the respondents or from outside sources. Uh, that's something that our human staff can do um, and something that the computer cannot. Uh, and so what we decided to do uh, is instead of making this sort of an all, uh, all or nothing approach, we decided we would try to use the computer to code the stuff that the, com that the computer does best and use our human staff to code the stuff uh, that they do best. Uh, and so now we just have to come up with some way of figuring out how to do this. Uh, I have a question that came in, Alex. Um, a question came in from uh, Justin Gosses, who, who asked, are both of these, the human and the computer um, columns, are they both against the gold standard? And was the training only gold standard data? or both gold and non-gold standard data used? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, so both of these evaluations are against the gold standard data. Uh, the gold standard data was not used for any of the training of the autocoder. Um, and that's a very important thing to do when evaluating machine learning systems. 
uh, because they can very easily memorize uh, the data that they're trained on. Uh, so thank you for that question. Um, so, uh, so the next uh, question I, uh, we're facing here is trying to figure out how to decide which cases get coded by our computer system uh, and which ones we'll have coded by our human staff. Uh, we have an uh, important tool to help us do this. Uh, that tool uh, is a probability score. Uh, and it turns out uh, that the machine learning algorithm that we're using uh, tells us not only which codes it thinks is best, but it also estimates the probability that those codes uh, are correct. Uh, and this is uh, important and for a number of reasons. One, these, the probability, these estimated probabilities actually are closely associated with the actual probabilities that these codes are correct. Uh, and so what this means is that our models, to some extent, knows when it knows the right answer. Uh, it knows when it doesn't know the right answer. Uh, this is reflected in the probability score that it assigns. Uh, and so we can use this probability score to decide uh, when we're going to route something to human staff who can go out and collect additional information, and when we're going to send it to a computer which can assign the code. The simplest way to do that is to choose a threshold uh, and say, you know, any, uh, any code that can be assigned with a probability above this threshold uh, will get assigned automatically. Everything else goes to human staff uh, for additional processing. Uh, so this gives us a way of deciding which stuff gets coded and uh, which stuff gets coded by hand and which stuff gets coded by computers. Um, but it still leaves the question of figuring out where we should set this probability threshold. Uh, now one approach that's uh, kind of popular is to just choose a threshold that sounds good. Um, but uh, we actually have a better option. Um, because our gold standard data shows how data would be coded uh, by our existing manual process, and because it also shows how data would be coded by an automated process, uh, we can actually use this gold standard data to simulate what the overall coding quality would be with various mixes of human and computer coding. Uh, and so the basic idea is that we will choose a threshold Assume that everything in the gold standard that could be auto-coded with a probability above that threshold receives the computer assigned code. Assume that everything else receives the manual code that was assigned to those cases. We can measure the quality of that performance and then we can repeat this process for all the various thresholds that we might set. Uh, so if we do this and then we graph the results out, uh, you'll get a graph that looks something like the one you see here on the right. Uh, on the vertical axis here, we have the two measures of coding quality, uh, accuracy, and something called the macro F1 score. And on the horizontal axis, uh, we have uh, the portion of cases that are being auto-coded. Uh, all the other cases are assumed to be manually coded. Uh, and so what this is showing us is the trade-off, or in some cases, the lack of trade-off uh, between coding quality and uh, the amount of automation uh, that we're using. Uh, and this is one of uh, the primary tools we use to decide uh, how much we will autocode, uh, where we will set those thresholds. And we also do a few other things uh, when rolling this out. Uh, one thing is that we moved very slowly. Uh, so as you'll see, this is a process that did not happen overnight. It's something um, that we rolled out gradually over uh, seven or eight years. Uh, we did this so that we could adjust our existing processes, adapt our existing processes uh, to these new systems, uh, and also so that we could verify uh, that everything is working as expected. Uh, the second thing we do is that we keep all our human staff uh, in the loop. Uh, so we still have all of our human coders out there. They still code the stuff that the autocoder does not do. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, we now ask them to review the codes that are being assigned uh, by the machine learning system and correct those codes when they find mistakes. Uh, this has allowed us to introduce an additional level of review uh, into our process. Uh, the third thing we do is that we continually remeasure and update our gold standard um, so that we know how our existing uh, manual process performs and so that we can verify that our autocoding system is still performing uh, as expected. 
Uh, so the rollout or the timeline uh, for the rollout of this system looks like this. It actually started in 2012. Uh, in 2012 and 2013, we used this uh, machine learning system solely to help us review data. Uh, we would code the data manually as normally, and then we would run the machine learning system against that data, identify, identify situations where the computer disagreed with the code assigned uh, by our human staff, and focus our review efforts on those. Uh, that was very, uh, a very sort of low risk, uh, effective way of improving our review and giving people an opportunity to see how these systems performed. Um, and by 2014, people were relatively comfortable with how these systems were performing. And so we began uh, using these systems to automatically assign some codes uh, directly in our production system. Uh, in 2014, we started with just 26% of occupation codes. Uh, that worked well. So we expanded uh, to nature and part in 2015. Uh, that worked well. So we expanded again in 2016, now to each of the major uh, coding categories. Uh, and then we expanded again in 2017. Uh, and you'll notice that in uh, between 2016 and 2017, uh, expansion in some of these categories uh, sort of leveled off. Uh, we were doing about the same amount of occupation, nature, uh, and part auto-coding. Uh, and that was because we were reaching uh, the limits of what we could do uh, with our existing models. Uh, so what happened in 2018? Uh, we just started collecting 2018 in January. Um, in 2018, actually, we dramatically increased the amount of auto-coding. Uh, and this was made possible uh, by switching to a new machine learning algorithm. Um, so what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about why we did that uh, and what it allows us to do. Um, so if you think about uh, what the old autocoder is doing, um, it's essentially doing the, the following. It's taking a narrative, it's chopping it up into the individual words that it contains. It is calculating how strongly each of these words is associated with the codes that could be assigned. Uh, and it's adding up that information and using that to assign the code uh, with the best evidence. Now, there's nothing uh, inherently wrong with this uh, uh, sort of idea. This is, uh, after all, something that we used very effectively for a number of years. Uh, but it does have a few limitations uh, that were incre increasingly uh, preventing us uh, from doing all of the things uh, that we wanted. Uh, and so I'm going to go through those very briefly. Uh, so problem number one uh, is that it turns out in English and uh, I think most languages, uh, the order in which words occurs is important. And unfortunately, our uh, old model only saw which words occur and not the order in which uh, those words occur. Uh, so this can cause problems, for example, in the following sentences, uh, worker fell on car and car fell on worker. Um, well, you and I can recognize that these describe very different uh, injuries or in events, certainly. Um, but to a model that only knows which words are occurring in the sentence, uh, these are in fact the exact same. Uh, and that could lead our old auto-coding model uh, to make mistakes. Uh, now there are some band-aids that you can put in place to mitigate this, uh, and we did this. Uh, one of the things you can do is you can tell your model to look at not just which individual words occur in the narrative, uh, but also which two word, maybe even three word sequences occur. Uh, this allows you to capture some of these uh, sort of short range context uh, in your sentences. Um, but one of the problems is uh, as you go to longer and longer word sequences, uh, you need more and more training data to act adequately learn what those uh, sequences mean. Um, and it, so it becomes extremely difficult beyond three word sequences. And really you would like to be able to capture much uh, longer dependencies than that because uh, in English it's very common uh, for words uh, to modify the meaning of word, other words that could be you know, many sentences apart. Um, and so this leads to problems, um, including probably the scariest error that I ever saw uh, made by our old autocoder. Um, we got a, a narrative that said no sign of concussion, and the old autocoder coded this uh, as a concussion, 
Uh, and not only did it code it as a concussion, uh, but it had a very high probability score associated with that code. Uh, and the reason for that is because if you can't see uh, the order in which those words occur, uh, you have no way of knowing that the no here is completely negating uh, the meaning of the word concussion. Um, so this could be, this is uh, in some cases a very important uh, limitation of this approach uh, to language processing. Uh, a second problem is uh, that to our old autocoder, each word uh, is treated as if it's completely different from all other words. Um, but the reality is that uh, in English, uh, words are sort of fuzzy concepts and they have all sorts of different relationships uh, with one another. Uh, so for example, uh, the word landscaper, uh, spelled correctly, I think, and the word landscaper, uh, likely spelled incorrectly, um, we, to you and I, those look like very similar words, and I think most of us would uh, think that there's a good chance that that second one is just a misspelling of the first. Um, but to the autocoder, uh, these words are as different from each other as a uh, landscaper is from the word turtle, uh, for example. Um, and that's an issue for two reasons. Um, one reason this is important is because we get a lot of spelling errors in the data we collect. Uh, people are uh, not too worried about spelling when they're filling out these injury reports. Um, and the second problem is that when these misspellings occur, very often we have very little information in our training data uh, available to teach the computer uh, what those words mean. Uh, and so if those words contain important information, uh, the autocoder is likely to make a mistake when those misspellings occur. Now, again, this is a, a situation where uh, there are some band-aids available. Uh, one thing we found useful was to include four-letter subsequences in our model. Uh, so our model is looking at not just which individual words occur and which pairs of words occur, but also which four-letter sequences occur within those words. Um, this is useful for detecting spelling errors in longer words. Uh, but of course, it's uh, an imperfect uh, heuristic. Um, misspellings can happen in words that have fewer than four letters, um, and uh, you, they can also introduce some issues of their own. Um, one third issue with our old autocoder uh, is actually that it was not just one autocoder, but rather five separate autocoders. Uh, one trained for occupation, one for nature, one for part, one for event, and one for source uh, coding. Uh, now, it's maybe not immediately obvious why this is a, a problem, but if you think about what each of these uh, models, these auto-coding models is doing, uh, essentially what it's doing is learning a little bit about how the words in the narrative, uh, what the words in the narrative mean by looking at which codes they're associated with. Uh, they're all looking at the same narrative, and they're all learning a little bit, something a little bit different because they're all using different codes, um, but they aren't sharing any of the information uh, that they're learning. Uh, so this is, in a sense, a, a very uh, inefficient way of learning how to read and interpret these narratives. Uh, and in this case, uh, there are no band-aids available, at least to my knowledge, um, using a logistic regression type model. Uh, so I bring up these three uh, limitations uh, with our old model because um, they happen to be three limitations uh, where researchers have made a lot of progress in addressing and solving these problems. Uh, and a lot of that work has happened uh, in an area of machine learning called deep learning, uh, which uses typically something called uh, the deep neural network. Um, what is a deep neural network? Well, uh, it sounds maybe a little fancier than it is. Uh, a, a deep neural network is essentially a bunch of logistic regression models uh, connected to each other. Um, so the uh, outputs from some logistic regressions become the inputs to others. You can connect these into all sorts of uh, different patterns uh, and shapes and sizes. Uh, so why do we do this? Um, well. Uh, one reason is because uh, for some things it just seems to work better. Um, but another reason is because it allows us to break down uh, our task into smaller steps and uh, design components of our model 
that can specialize in addressing uh, each of these steps. Uh, so how do you break down a task uh, like reading a narrative and assigning codes? Um, well, we don't have to figure it out from scratch. There's lots of research uh, going on on how this is done. And so we simply follow this, uh, which is pretty similar to what a lot of natural language processing practitioners do. Uh, we broke this, the steps down as follows. Uh, step one, uh, look at each word in the narrative and figure out what it means, ideally in a way that allows us to address any spelling issues that occur. Step two is to look at each word uh, in the narrative in the context in which it occurs and figure out how that the meaning of that word is modified by the words that come before and after it. Step three uh, is to look through each of the words in the narrative and figure out what is relevant to our coding task so that we can focus in on just that information uh, that we need for our particular task. And then step four is to use that information uh, to predict the codes. Um, so this looks like uh, if in a neural network, uh, it looks like the following. Uh, at the very bottom of this neural network, we have the case narrative. This is the input to the neural network. Uh, the first thing we do uh, is run that case narrative through the word encoder. Uh, what the word encoder does is it looks at each individual word in that narrative. In fact, it looks at each individual character in each of those words and tries to figure out what that word means. Well, once it's done processing in the word encoder, it feeds that information uh, to the narrative encoder. Uh, the job of the narrative encoder is to figure out what each word means in the context in which it occurs. Uh, the narrative encoder accomplishes this using a recurrent neural network called a long short-term memory network. Uh, and what the network is doing is it's essentially keeping track of the words that have come before each word and the words that come afterwards. Uh, after the narrative has been passed through the narrative encoder, the information is then fed to five separate uh, task-specific modules, each of which has two parts. Uh, the first part is the attention layer. Uh, the job of the attention layer is to sift through the information in the narrative and identify the information that is relevant to that particular task. Uh, that information is then fed to the final output layer. Uh, and if you look at the leftmost uh, sort of top node here in this diagram, uh, that is the SOC, that's the occupation output layer. Uh, the occupation output layer uh, is actually uh, almost exactly equivalent to the old uh, logistic regression model. It's simply generating probability scores for each of the codes that might be assigned uh, to this narrative. Um, in fact, all of these output layers uh, are almost equivalent, uh, almost exactly the same as the logistic regression models that we were using uh, before. Uh, so one way of thinking about what we're doing here uh, is simply taking the old models and then adding a bunch of layers of pre-processing underneath. Uh, unfortunately, this is the code for this cannot be fit on one slide, at least not in a way that uh, you could read it. Uh, it's a, a little bit more complicated. Uh, we do have the code available uh, on GitHub and we'll have links to that in just a second. Um, but is it worth it? Uh, does this give us any benefit? Um, well, uh, I hope so. Um, and we have lots of reason to believe it does. Uh, this is an evaluation that we did comparing uh, our manual process to our logistic regression and our neural network autocoders. Um, and what it's showing is that the neural network autocoder on average uh, makes about 24% fewer coding errors uh, than our old logistic regression systems and about 40% fewer errors uh, than our previous manual process. Uh, uh, this year we started using the neural network autocoder. Uh, I think so far it's assigned more than 80% of the codes uh, that we collected this year and assign them at accuracies higher than we've ever been able to assign codes uh, before. Um, so uh, this has been a very uh, effective technique. Uh, and I should mention that this, uh, these techniques have been very effective, not just for our survey, uh, the survey of occupational injuries and illnesses, uh, but there are now a wide variety of similar projects throughout the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, applying these same ideas uh, and getting uh, very good results. Um, so there's a lot of exciting machine learning stuff 
uh, very, it's, uh, it's, it's really transforming the way we process a lot of the language data that we work with uh, at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, so this brings us to the last slide. Um, if you're interested in learning more, we have some tutorials that we've used uh, in-house to, to train uh, other teams how to build these systems. And many of those teams have gone on to, to build very useful uh, machine learning systems. Uh, this first tutorial is a tutorial on how to build the logistic regression-based autocoders. Um, if you're just starting out in machine learning, uh, this is where I recommend uh, starting out. It's much easier to build these systems. You don't need any fancy uh, hardware typically. Um, and then below that we have uh, some tutorials on neural networks if you'd like to try something uh, a little more, uh, a little fancier but also a little more difficult. Uh, we also have links to papers describing uh, our logistic regression and neural network autocoders and then we also have at the very bottom uh, a link to the source code uh, for our existing neural autocoder. Um, so I think this brings us to uh, my favorite part of the presentation, which is uh, the questions. Thanks very much, Alex. So a couple questions that came in um, while you were talking uh, around training and training um, um, data. So I'm just going to give you a couple of them so that you could um, pull it together. Um, um, it, it was about training and learning. So um, does your autocoder continue to learn from human coded data that it couldn't code initially? How does the system, how does the system react if it does get retrained by data? And um, how does, you know, how does it degrade over time or does it degrade over time um, depending upon new data, new inputs? Uh, those are great questions. Um, all right, so how do we, uh, so we do continually retrain it. Uh, we typically retrain it each year at the end of each collection cycle. We will take all the data that's come in, including uh, the data that uh, it wasn't able to assign before and use that uh, to retrain the autocoder. And it typically uh, gets a little better each, each time. Uh, at this point, um, you know, we have so much training data that, uh, that uh, another year worth doesn't make a huge difference, but it is continually uh, learning uh, and continually being updated to deal with changes. Uh, the second question was about um, how does this system react uh, to changes in our data over time? Um, and that's a very, uh, very important question. Um, and it's something that we monitor very carefully. It's one of the reasons why uh, we update our gold standard each year is to see um, is the system still performing as expected uh, on new data? Uh, so far, uh, we have not seen any big changes uh, in the way that you know people describe injuries. For example, uh, there are occasions where you know new uh, new words uh, emerge and new things like you know the job title of data scientist that maybe didn't exist uh, 20 years ago. Um, and there are situations where you know it's not able to capture those new phenomena, and we have to wait until new training data is available uh, to update it. Um, but so far, the changes uh, that we've seen have been uh, relatively small, and so we haven't had to do a lot of retraining of the model to adapt it to new uh, things. Terrific. Um, so I'm going to take the um, uh, prerogative moderator to ask a couple questions I have, and we're going to turn back to um, uh, some of the questions online. Um, one of the things you talk about here is you know, the fact that humans were doing it, machines do it better than humans. How did you work with your colleagues in terms of them trusting this? Because it really creates a change for them um, in terms of they're looking at their work, um, their, their, the way that it might change the way that they're um, interacting. Um, and then again, it's like, you know, was there a problem with them trusting the, work, the, the outputs? Uh, yeah, so that's a great question. So what... Um I'd say if we did a few things I think that helped a lot. One of the things we did is we did this gradually. So we rolled this out very gradually, starting with using it as a review tool. Um, and so that gave people who do this uh, regularly a chance to see what the autocoder was suggesting as alternatives. And uh, it was also relatively low risk because we know people are taking a very close uh, look at, at what's going on. Um, 
what we found is that uh, people were really happy actually to have some assistance uh, doing this. Um, you know, if you spend a lot of time doing this, it's not always the funnest thing in the world. Um, and so uh, I think I've, we've been, uh, certainly I've been very happy to see how, uh, how quick uh, the, the state staff have been, have been to embrace this. I think they really like this tool. It helps them uh, spend more time on other important tasks that they need to perform. Um, and it automates, you know, a little bit of the, uh, maybe the less enjoyable work that they have to do. So was there anything that you did in particular in terms of change management and making sure that the people on the state level were able to contact you all back um, and, and um, potentially provide um, some, some feedback? Yeah, uh, so uh, feedback from the states is a, a very important part of this project uh, from the start. So, um, you know, the, when we send these uh, sort of review reports out that have been generated by the autocoder, uh, those go to our state and regional offices, um, and we encourage those offices to uh, to send back feedback to us to tell us what they're seeing and what they're um, encountering, and and that very often leads to uh, improvements in, in the model. Uh, I noticed, uh, you know, a few years ago, one of our, our regional staff, uh, you know, pointed out that the autocoder was getting a bunch of teachers wrong. Uh, I think it was. You know, we were trying to figure out it was coding a bunch of elementary school teachers as high school teachers or something like that. Uh, and so I looked at the data and I looked at the job title and it just says teacher in there. And so I said, well, how do you know these are elementary or high school teachers? Um, and she said, well, it's right there in the unit description, uh, which is another piece of information that we get. Well, you know, it never occurred to me that we actually use that for anything, um, certainly for occupation coding. And, and so we you know, that in interaction uh, told me, okay, maybe we should add that into our autocoder, and we did, and it led to improvements uh, in the quality of, of the autocoding. So uh, feedback from our state and regional offices is, you know, it, it, in many ways, it's the primary input to the machine learning system. Um, so we, um, we rely on that very heavily, uh, and we do uh, our best to encourage that. I'm going back to some of the um, uh, uh, more technical and, and the, um, the platform that you're running on. A couple of questions uh, came in. Um, one being, um, um, is Python a baseline software at BLS? Um, are there any challenges that you have in terms of open code software being approved? Um, did you encounter any challenges in getting an ATO for your neural net? Um, and any kind of additional information about the, the underlying platform that you're running? Is it running cloud? Is it uh, on-prem or what? Yeah. Um, so uh, we're, uh, we're currently running these systems uh, on-premises. Uh, I think we're still trying to figure out how we can uh, uh, use cloud services and still maintain the uh, the various legal requirements that we have on, on protecting our data. Um, is Python a baseline or widely used software at BLS? It, it was not when we started. Actually, it was uh, very few people used it uh, in BLS. Um, it is, however, uh, probably the most popular programming language for machine learning among machine learning practitioners. Um, and so one of the things we had to do was uh, sort of convince people that it was worth uh, uh, investing in Python because because of all the machine learning tools that Python uh, gives us, um, and that's a process that's continuing. We still spend a lot of uh, I you know I for example teach a Python machine learning course each year um, to help expand those skills uh, in BLS, and uh, they've, those skills are, are growing very rapidly. Um, but that is a, a transition that takes some time. Um, ATO, actually, I don't know what an ATO is. That's authority to operate. Authority to operate, yeah. So it's, it's make sure that it meets uh, security standards. Oh, okay. Uh, so we didn't have any uh, issues with the ATO for um, Python. Um, Python is included, I think, by default on most Linux distributions, and uh, most of our servers are running on Linux. Um, so uh, it's you know it's approved in, in that sense. It's also widely used in industry and other government agencies so it, 
Uh, it's not something that's, uh, you know, too sort of fringe. It's actually a very widely used language for these uh, purposes. Um, it just doesn't happen to be too common uh, here. Uh, one uh, hard, uh, I should mention that the, uh, as far as the computer hardware, um, our logistic regression models, things that we trained on our laptops, um, you don't typically need fancy hardware to build those. Uh, to build deep neural networks, however, uh, you typically do need uh, more advanced hardware. Uh, typically, you need something like a, a, a GPU, a graphical processing unit. Um, and for that, we were uh, able to purchase uh, a few of those uh, for a re relatively affordable price and install that uh, on the server on premises. Great. Um, a couple questions came in uh, in terms of we're, we're talking about authorities, et cetera. Um, how, um, how do you, you convince people that, you know, that people, how are people, what, would, what did you do to convince people that um, the algorithms were right or the business rules that, that, that audit trail on it? Um, is there some types of reporting that you have that you have that you're providing to audit staff or the inspector general or whatever? Uh, yeah, that's a great question, and that was uh, you know one of the uh, the biggest challenges in in rolling this out. Um, uh, I think one of the most important things we did uh, to convince people that this was worth pursuing uh, is that we evaluated it uh, in a way that allowed us co to compare it directly to our existing process. Um, you know, uh, when someone you know is saying arguing that no, we shouldn't be using this. Um, they're, they're arguing that we need to stay with the existing process, and it was uh, relatively easy to show that there were plenty of limitations uh, with the existing process. Um, so I think that was one of the key things uh, that we did. Uh, the other thing that we do, and, and we still spend a, a great deal of time on, is, is monitoring these systems. We're not, you know, we're not sort of turning the machine learning system on and then forgetting about it. Um, we still have, we still direct our, 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 our human coders um, to review the codes that are being assigned by these systems, to change them when they're incorrect, to tell us if it notices, if they notice uh, patterns of errors. Um, and we still have processes that continually, continuously reevaluate uh, these systems uh, each month. Um, so uh, in many ways, uh, we are sort of evaluating these systems much more than we uh, evaluated coding in the past. Um, the one, another question came in uh, really about kind of the, the volume. How much volume of data are you dealing with? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So um, it sort of depends how you count. Uh, each year we collect about 300,000 uh, of these injury narratives. So that's about how much we're processing. Um, the training data that we have now available, which we've collected over uh, a number of years now, is about 1.5 million narratives. Um, so it's a, a sizable uh, amount of data, um, but it's something that you can still you know, do with relatively modest uh, hardware. Um, have you done anything um, in other languages other than English? Oh, uh, that's a good one. Um, that's a really good one. Um, so, uh, so yes and no. Um, so some of the data that we collect through our survey, uh, Puerto Rico, for example, is, is part of our survey. And uh, some of the data that we get from them is in Spanish. Um, until, uh, so far we have sort of tried to avoid answering that question and, tr and we focused on English. Um, but one of the things we're gonna be doing this year is seeing if we can expand uh, the neural autocoder to to Spanish. Uh, I think one of the uh, one of the concerns with the logistic regression autocoder is that um, it might confuse you know Spanish words and English words that might have similarities. Um, and but we think we can get the neural network autocoder uh, to handle those things. And so we think we'll be able to uh, train this to be a sort of bilingual uh, autocoding system. Uh, that remains to be uh, completely. Uh, demonstrated, but I, uh, but there's a lot of evidence that it's that it's possible. That's very exciting. So, I also want to talk a little bit about about you on the in this process as well, because I'm sure people who are um, listening in are like, 
well, gosh, you know, I wish I was a brilliant data scientist like Alex Measure, mm -hmm. um, uh, which of course we all do in this room as well. But my question for you is, tell us a little bit about, you know, how you came um, to develop this level of expertise. Um, you know, I, I, in doing research around uh, artificial intelligence, one of the uh, one of the things that Gartner talks about is what they call you know citizen data scientists. You know, people who have skill sets that develop into data science. I think you have a great story around that, and I think that people might be able to learn from you. Thank you. Um, so, um, I I did not start out as a data scientist. In fact, I think my official title is still. Uh, economist, maybe with data scientist in parentheses. I think that's uh, allowed now. Um, but I started as a, an economist at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, and one of my jobs uh, as a new economist was to review these narratives uh, and look for coding errors. Um, and uh, uh, I admit that it wasn't my favorite uh, <laughs> activity, and so that provided good uh, motivation to look for ways uh, to automate this task. Uh, I was fortunate at the time that this was uh, right around the time that uh, these, uh, mass, these online courses like Coursera and uh, edX and others were um, starting to, to put a lot of content out. Uh, one of the first, some of the first courses on Coursera, there was a machine learning course uh, and a natural language processing course. Uh, and so I took those classes uh, and I started applying uh, what I was learning, um, and it just sort of uh, went from there. Um, so, uh, I, I, you know, I think uh, an important point is that uh, data scientists are not born, uh, they are trained. Um, and uh, and I, I think another important point is that uh, this, uh, you know, the stuff that we call AI and machine learning uh, is very often closely related uh, to other things that are probably more broadly uh, uh, studied, uh, things like statistical learning uh, and those related concepts are very closely related uh, to what you're, we're doing in machine learning. Uh, and so that makes it, I think, relatively accessible for field for people who already have uh, those skills. So you were a curious guy and you decided to move into this space. Um, how did you explain this to your boss and to get your boss to buy in on this? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, so this was, uh, you know, so the, this project sort of, there were forces happening from multiple directions. Um, so uh, some of our senior management at the time uh, had noticed uh, that some academics were uh, using these techniques uh, to, um, to solve similar challenges. And uh, so I think that got them interested in exploring how uh, they might uh, do something similar in our agency. Uh, they noticed, of course, that I, that I had been experimenting with this uh, as well. Um, and they also had um, some funding at the time um, to, to, um, to explore this a little further. And, and so it was sort of the confluence of those forces uh, that led them to create a, a position eventually um, to allow me to work on this full time. And, um, uh, and, and sort of went from there. Um, I know that, you know, uh, you know, people are always interested in kind of, you know, you know, how does somebody end up getting to, to, to do this type of work? Are there, um, one of the things I think was really important that you mentioned is that you actually had a problem to solve. Um, and that was uh, uh, probably the most important um, uh, factor moving forward. But let's say somebody has a problem to solve they have some data, um, uh, or, or they think they might be able to uh, apply machine learning. Um, what are some questions that they should ask themselves in terms of how to prepare for this type of journey? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And I, um, you know, actually, I've, I, often I get the question, how do I do it before they've identified the problem or the data? So <laughs> I would say those are the first two important, the most important first steps. Uh, start with the problem uh, and start with uh, training data. Um, you know, the most effective technique of AI right now is the supervised machine learning. Uh, and it relies on training data that shows, you know, both the inputs to your task and the desired outputs. Um, so, you know, 
Job number one, and I think maybe the most common pitfall that I see people running into is that they don't have uh, the training data. Uh, once you have uh, the training data and you know a, a well-defined problem that associated with it, uh, you've in many ways done most of the, most of the work. Um, the next step, uh, I you know I, we have some tutorials, for example, which walk you through the basic process of how to uh, implement some of these ideas. Um, but I think the next step is really to look at uh, what how are other people addressing uh, these challenges. Um, there's a whole, you know, there's many different sort of subfields of machine learning and there's all sorts of research and there's tons of tools available online and courses available online. Um, and so, you know, I mean, it's certainly if you're doing some sort of text classification stuff, the tutorials that I, that I um, link to at the end, I think are a good starting point and uh, many of my colleagues have, have found those to be helpful. Um, but for other things, uh, I really rec I really like some of the courses uh, the courses you can find on Coursera. I, I know I started with Andrew Ng's uh, machine learning class, and that was uh, a great introduction to the basic ideas. Um, and uh, and it's it's really amazing how much you can uh, do with a, a couple of these classes, which you can audit in many cases for free. That's terrific. Um, my last question um, um, is really around um, expectation management, um, because one of the things I think is super compelling about your story is that there are many iterations and that there was an, a, a process that has been going over you know, five to eight years. Um, how did you, um, um, or did you uh, work with uh, uh, your management, your leadership, to help them understand kind of what to expect over time? Or did you just hide under a rock while you were doing this <laughs> work, or what? No, no, um, and, and I think that uh, communication uh, is maybe my primary job, actually. Um, and it's certainly I, what I spent most of my time on uh, initially because uh, you know, it, was very, it is very important that management uh, understood what was going on, understood how these systems worked, uh, and understood the, the strengths and the limitations uh, of those systems. So actually, I, I think maybe I spend more time on communication than machine learning um, these days. Um, the, uh, the way that you communicated, um, you know, I... I I think it certainly helps to sort of show people the basic ideas. Uh, I, a lot of you know, a lot of people at BLS, for example, are are familiar with ideas like regression, logistic regression, and stuff. Um, and machine learning is, uh, in many ways, just an extension of that idea. Uh, and so, the more that we can sort of uh, relate it to things that they're already comfortable comfortable with, I, I think that was very effective in, in sort of explaining. Uh, what was going on and I also think it was really important that we we constructed our evaluation in a way that allowed us to compare directly to the existing process if we did not have that evaluation it would have been much harder uh, and I know that because I've, I've seen other organizations try and do the same thing without that evaluation uh, and if you don't know how your system compares to the existing uh, process you have no way of knowing whether it's better or worse than the existing process. Uh, you don't have a good way of making uh, good judgments about to what extent you should use one process uh, or the other. So I, I think that's a very important step uh, in, in implementing these projects. Thank you, Alex. I want to thank you very much for sharing everything that you've talked about today. I could probably talk to you for another two hours, but our time is at an end. I want to thank everybody who have joined us on the uh, webinar today. Um, you'll be sent an, uh, information about you know, telling us if you like this or not. Um, if there are other examples that you're aware of, we're happy to host additional webinars on, in this topic space. Um, and if you want to keep track of what's happening um, in government space and uh, artificial intelligence, I do recommend there's an AI listserv for government folks as well as for folks outside of government. Um, and if you go to digital.gov, you'll be able to get more information on that. Thank you.